Good evening and hello. hello. I'm uh, David Wiegold. I'm the president of the DC chapter of the American Society of Media Photographers, the ASMP. Uh, welcome to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, it's a real honor to host Mark Seliger here tonight. It's the second year that we're able to present in this beautiful theater, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank the people who made this wonderful event possible. Uh, the uh, museum director, thank you, Betsy Brune. Uh, the museum marketing manager, Amy Hutchins. And the museum external affairs staff, including uh, Kaylin LePen. Where are you out there? OK. And uh, a special thanks goes out to the Center for Media and Social Impact School of Communications, the American University, uh, for their generous financial support. Uh, specifically, Lena Jaswal for her help. Uh, we love our sponsors. <laughs> Also, um, I'd like to recognize especially the uh, ASMP DC board. Um, putting together a program like this takes many, many months. And this all-volunteer group is incredible, and I'm very honored uh, to be working with them to bring you guys great programs such as the one tonight. Uh, thank you all, our board. If you're uh, not familiar with the ASMP, please visit us at asmpdc.org. Uh, there you can sign up for our mailing list uh, to be notified of upcoming events and programs and such. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Michael Mansfield, who is the Smithsonian American Art Museum's curator of film and media arts. He'll be welcoming Mark Selger. Thank you and enjoy. Hello, and uh, welcome to the Donald W. Reynolds Center for American Art and Portraiture. On uh, behalf of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and our colleagues at the National Portrait Gallery, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you for tonight's quite fascinating, I think, discussion with uh, Mark Seliger. Um, I'd like to extend a, a quick thank you to uh, Ruth Levy, his uh, producer, and his archivist, Brian Meter. Brian Meter is here. Ruth, I believe, is not here. But uh, I think... Uh, their, their assistance has been really invaluable in, in setting up a program like this at the museum, getting all the images together and, and, and helping us organize these things. So um, they're quite important folks. Um, and I'd also like to say that I'm proud to have, share some Texas roots with Mark Seliger, who was born in Amarillo, Texas in 1959. Um, I also grew up in Texas. Um, uh, he, he spent a few years in Amarillo before moving to Houston, Texas in 1964. Um, his, his, his interest in photography really began very early in life. Um, his first love quickly became the dark room where the magic happens, and in this case it was in, uh, in I think, his family's bathroom, um, <laughs> where he began experimenting with uh, developing negatives and printing photographs. Um, he attended Houston's High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, and from there attended East Texas State University uh, in Commerce, Texas. Um, and that's where his education really began in earnest, studying, studying the history of photography, history of documentary photography. Um, he moved to New York City in 1984 and very quickly, in a very short three years, uh, became a shooter for Rolling Stone in 1987. And in 1992 was signed as their chief photographer. And during his time at Rolling Stone, he shot well over 125 covers. I believe that number is actually quite a bit higher, but uh, um, a little bit higher. <laughs> Um, in 2001, uh, Mark moved from Rolling Stone to Condé Nast and began making images for Vanity Fair, Details, Italian Vogue, L'Omo Vogue, and German Vogue. Um, in 2011, he founded the, uh, co-founded the nonprofit exhibition space for photography with Brent Langton called 401 Projects, where they mounted a, uh, a number of significant exhibitions by contemporary photographers. And additionally, Mark organizes and hosts the Emmy-nominated Capture on YouTube's Reserve channel. Um, this is a, uh, a production that stages candid and really revealing conversations between established photographers such as Mary Ellen Mark, Martin Schuller, and Bob Groon with celebrities who are keenly interested in photography such as Dylan McDermott, Helena Christensen, and, and Kevin Bacon. I particularly like that one. Um, so if you get a chance to go on and, uh, and look at some of these, I think they're really quite revealing. Um, he continues his love of the dark room and, he, and uses a palladium printing process. We had the opportunity to look at a few of these earlier today. They're really quite stunning images, really rich, fantastic photographs. Um, he's published numerous books and is the esteemed recipient of the Alfred, Alfred Eisenstadt Award, the Lucy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Portraiture, and the Clio Grand Prix. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mark Seliger.
Thank you, guys. Um, Sam, thank you so much. It's really nice to be here in, uh, in the great walls of the Smithsonian. And uh, lovely to speak to you guys. I think I've been to Washington to talk before years ago. But um, I just want to kind of articulate this is a very laid back discussion. And I usually speak off the cuff more than a planned talk. But I will. And I'm going to be happy to answer any questions afterwards. So hold on to those questions. We can do this. OK, so now I just have to figure out how this thing works here, which shouldn't be too complicated. Let's see. There we are. OK, I figured it out. Uh, can I turn this down just a little bit right on me? That's perfect. Thank you. So I wanted, I've never done this presentation before. This is kind of a new thing. And Brian, who is my archivist here, who, Brian, where are you? There he is. There's Brian, ladies and gentlemen. Brian Meter. He, uh, young young man who's been in my studio for just a little bit over probably a year and a half, two years, and uh, he's very involved in in working with me on uh, on uh, coordinating these slideshows, and then does all all of our archiving at the studio and, and much more. Anyway. So we dug this old picture up. This is the first photograph I did in a documentary class in Texas at East Texas State University on your, not the guy on the right. <laughs> that guy is not from Texas. Want to establish that. Uh, but the guy on the left. So I was really influenced early on. My teacher was just pushing the history of photography. And my first real connection to portraiture was Arnold Newman. Right? So get the connection. So I was, I was a little bit of a, you know, kind of a typical Gemini, right? So I had a couple of things I liked. Like there's two of me for sure, maybe four. So I also loved Irving Penn. And I just thought it was really interesting, like in just the dialogue that we're going to have tonight about kind of the evolution of one's career and how portraiture has really many layers to it and a lot of depth to it. It's environmental and then it's also the reduction of portraiture which is clearly this picture of Obama, right? So we're going to get a little bit further into that but I just kind of wanted to show you the range of like what I consider to be my best picture when I was starting out and what I consider to be my best picture, you know, mid-career or whatever you want to call this that I'm doing. So I'm going to give you a couple of little quick anecdotes about process. Now, what, if there's technique that you guys want to know about, we can talk about that a little bit later. But I'm going to tell you about the way that I create image, images, which I, I think is sort of my specialty. So I, when I started with Rolling Stone, uh, I think clearly what gave me a jump forward was that I didn't really focus on black and white. I focused on color, right? So color photography was saturated. It printed really well in Rolling Stone magazine because it had such shitty paper, right? That's like the worst paper possible. So the more saturated and the more involved it was in terms of the, 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 the like surreal quality, the better it looked on the page, right? So I almost had a kind of a cartoon experience with color. So I lit everything. And this was a... My uh, 92 uh, participation in a portfolio where there was five other photographers that were given portfolios. I was kind of the young buck at the time. So it was like Bruce Weber and Herb Ritz. And I was just li literally like pissing in my pants about that I was going to be doing this. And I had, they gave me 10 <coughs> photographs to do. And the first one that I was assigned was Fleetwood Mac. Now, not the whole band, just Mick Fleetwood and John McVie, right? Is everybody familiar with Mick Fleetwood Mac? All right. Love the record. Love the music. So they said, OK, here's your first assignment. You know, call. Here's a number, which was really interesting because, like, you know, talking to an artist for me was like that was kind of a big deal. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I was going to say to them at, at first. So I knew I had to have come up with an idea. So I. I had already thought about it. They had a 25th anniversary they were celebrating. Rolling Stone was celebrating. And I thought, oh, man, how great would it be if they were doing a wedding picture together? 
And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to make this work, but I'm going to figure it out. And uh, I called up Mick Fleetwood at the recording studio, and I said, and he gets on the phone, he says, hello, Mark, it's Mick Fleetwood. I was like, hello, Mick, it's Mark. He goes, what are your ideas for us? And just like, I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to tell you my idea now. I was going to kind of wait on it. <laughs> I said, well, I was thinking about maybe you guys doing a wedding picture since it's, God bless you, 25th anniversary, 20th anniversary for Rolling Stone. What do you think of that? And he goes, hmm, I love it, but I have one, one request. I was like, what that, what's that? He goes, can I be the bride? <laughs> so that's pretty much a home run. This is an extremely stoned Carlos Santana. <laughs> I actually don't even think he knew his picture was being taken. <laughs> or wearing a Bob Marley t-shirt, for that matter. So this is, this is, again, the use of color, right? So we're out in the middle of uh, these foothills we found in San Francisco. And a mustard field was just perfectly like blooming at that time. And I had scouted it the day before. And we picked this place, and it was just kind of weirdly coincidental that the shirt and the guitar, the Jamaican guitar, everything kind of worked out perfectly for us. So, so what happens when you're thinking and you're writing down all your ideas, and you're thinking, how am I going to illustrate the world's greatest drummer? Oh, he'll have four hands. So that was my assistant's hands, and the stylist, at the time, this is all for the 25th anniversary. The stylist at the time, Ariane Phillips, who is amazing, and is amazing, uh, she built two extra sleeves from the shirt. And so my assistant put it through his arms, through Ringo's arms, which was very uncomfortable. And, um, and uh, that's the picture, so it's totally just a gag. This was kind of like my journey into portraiture where I would start to use 4x5 uh, early on. This is in 92. I'd use 4x5 and it would be a constant, uh, um, you know, re-entry into kind of a reductive portrait. So that, this is obviously George Harrison. Funny thing about George Harrison is that Amazing moment, we had uh, ukuleles in there for him to play because I was told he really liked ukule ukuleles and he was still pissed off about a review in Rolling Stone for Dark Horse that after he finished the shoot, he walked out with the most expensive ukulele. And I said, uh, I, oh, hey, George, um, that's a rental ukulele, it's uh, Martin. And he goes, oh, yeah, he goes, Bill Yon Winna. So, <laughs> very low this is very, this is very uh, low tech here. We were shooting the shot in Tunbridge Wells at Jeff Beck's property, and we saw the sheep walking across the field, and I made his wife come and feed him pretty close to his head. But super low tech. This was one of the first, I started to do Rolling Stone covers um, pretty early on, like uh, it's the second year I started working with them as a freelancer. And this was obviously you know, is obviously um, Lou Reed. And this was for his New York record. Um, sorry, I was talking to Jane from, I think it's NBC or ABC or one of those big networks. But we were talking about photographing these guys in Melbourne. And in Melbourne, I traveled over there to shoot uh, uh, Nirvana right when Nevermind broke out. And I was... I met with the band, and I knew that they wore clothing with writing on it to support you know, these smaller grassroots bands in uh, Seattle. So I talked to, I didn't meet Kurt the first day. I met Dave and Chris, and I said to, to Dave, I said, hey, is there any way that you guys can make sure you don't wear T-shirts with writing on it, because it's really going to distract with the, kind of the type on the magazine. He was like, oh, yeah, I'll pass that on to everybody. <laughs> And so I said, okay, great. So that, that, that's like telling a child, like, don't do something. You know, don't write on crayon on the wall. That's a bad idea, right? So the next day, they show up at location. Van pulls up. It's a small little van. Chris gets out. Dave gets out, get out, and they're laughing. And I'm going, what's so funny? And then Kurt gets out and says, corporate magazines still suck, written on his shirt. 
I was, I felt like an idiot. I was trying to finagle the glasses off or the shirt, change the shirt, nothing worked. I came back after sweating it out on a plane and uh, the magazine loved it and they ran it just like that. Fiona Apple. So this was the, Under the Waves. It's a, kind of a line in one of her songs and I just thought it was very ethereal and very beautiful and poetic the way that you know, she's saying about this kind of like beautiful quiet underneath the water. And so this was my concept for a cover. And we made a tank, and, uh, which her manager was very nervous about because we had big electrical lighting. Um, <laughs> as she was flying in water, I was like, ah, don't worry about it. She'll, you know, this is her first and last record. <laughs> so uh, this is the beautiful moment when a, a band comes up to you and go like, we got an idea. And you're like, What's your idea, guys? And it's like, we're Metallica, skull and crossbones. <laughs> I was like, all right, how am I going to make this work? Skull and crossbones. <laughs> so I, I got it. Skull and crossbones, right? Skull and crossbones. So I set up a black background, and I made sure that it just was skull and crossbones. Metallica. So this was my idea. I was trying to figure out Kid Rock. Now, you know, I grew up in Texas, so... Um, I can appreciate a little redneck fine art, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking if, 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 if Kid Rock were to make a totem, right, what would the totem be? It wouldn't be a bear, wouldn't be like Bigfoot, right? It would be a very large-breasted woman. This is um, kind of a, a groove that I started on where I was shooting more reportage. So I would go on to a set or I'd go into somebody's home and I would just sort of shoot loosey-goosey. And this was um, a moment during the chronic when Dre and Snoop were taking a break during the making of a video. And I realized why we were shooting in that location. Because Dr. Dre was on house arrest if you look at his right an left ankle. <laughs> He couldn't go anywhere. So, so, you know, not everything looks kind of like big production. And when we're working, we're trying to create a little bit of a, of a theater in, in, in terms of like the more controlled, contrived pictures. So this shot of Tom Waits came about when I asked Tom to be in my first signature book, which was uh, with Rolling Stone and, and the pictures I'd taken with them. And uh, I went to Northern California, and I, and I asked Tom, I mean, he invited me, and I went there, and I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I have an idea. And he said, you know, he asked me what my idea was, and he didn't like it. And he goes, how about if you guys, meaning my assistant and myself, go dig a grave, <laughs> and I'll come over. I got a shovel and a wheelbarrow. And I was like, all right, where should we dig a grave? He goes, well, downtown, I live in a small little town in Northern California, there's a graveyard, and I think you guys will be fine. <laughs> I'm going, are you serious? We're, you don't want us to go dig it? Yeah, I'll be there around five. So we go around trying to find somebody to let us dig a grave, and we couldn't find anybody. The whole town was shut down. So we just went over there and dug a grave, and, and nobody bothered us. And uh, Tom came, and we did this picture. This is a, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's this kind of like sad, kind of a funny, ironic sadness about Lyle, and, and he's always kind of this sort of sarcastic, uh, you know, trend in his music. So this is like the guy that just is the last at the party that no one came to. <laughs> this was a, a little bit of a bend in terms of I started to work a lot more in the studio and to create sets in the studio. And a friend of mine, uh, Patrick Parkhurst, who's a great set builder, helped me design this kind of honeycomb box that we painted silver and then uh, we tar and feathered the man that I think people revered and also reviled. So this was Marilyn Manson being tar and feathered. And this is all, most of the stuff is all on camera. There might be a little bit of moving a feather around, but pretty honest. This is the big bling, Nellie. This was for... 
I'd moved over from uh, shooting for Rolling Stone to going to working for Vanity Fair. And uh, with Vanity Fair, I did kind of a different thing. It was more, God bless you, it was more of a, uh, of a lusher, a little more extravagant experience. And, um, and so they always wanted things to be very kind of like high end. And this was our, our answer to, you know, kind of that time in hip hop where things were very blingy. This was really funny. This, was, uh, this moment was um, pretty authentic. We set up this throne in the middle of Times Square because it was the king and he was the king of New York. And, uh, and Puff, who I had met a couple of times and, and was notoriously difficult on set, showed up at around 1230 at night uh, in Times Square. And it was really busy and really crazy. And we had a throne set up. And he came in. And first thing he said to me is like, I don't like the throne. I'm like, OK, well, we're going to just have to figure that one out. And uh, eventually, I talked him into liking the throne. So this is, this is around 2.30 in the morning <laughs> after he decided he did like the throne. This is a nice little moment with Keith Richards. So this is my studio in New York. And um, I've always loved the way that he sort of moves, slinks around. It's almost like ballet when you see him on stage. Well, it's, it's kind of drunken ballet. But it's, it's like Barishnikov with like a six pack. But it's, it's pretty great when you see him perform and he goes into this mode. So anyway, we shot a series of photographs and then we, we pasted them together. This was um, Jack White and this was in Atlanta and, uh, sorry, Nashville. And um, we found, kind of skirted around and found an old sort of Model T truck that we were able to drag to the location that we were at. And we found this the day before. But this, the whole idea behind it was this, this kind of decaying moment uh, with, with this, this stuff going around him. Anyway, that's his outfit, uh, Jack White. That was recently done. So right after that, and I want to just uh, see if I can find my notes here. Right. Uh, after the, uh, the, the kind of entree into Rolling Stone around 96, I decided to reach out and, uh, and figure out a book that I wanted to do. And, and when I was in Houston growing up, there, were, there was a, um, a moment experience when I went into a bakery, a Jewish bakery, where we used to get our challah. And I saw a tattoo on one of the, one of the guys that was running the bakery and, uh, and you know, realized that he was a survivor. But it was... Still pretty shocking. I mean, you guys, you know, are obviously, you know, pretty aware of what's going on with the museum here. But at that time in the 70s, you know, it was it was pretty shocking to see somebody with a tattoo and think of them as like they had made it through, they had survived. And I, so I did a book on survivors. So this is a little quote in the book, and uh, Fred Woodward designed the book. I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you a little little bit about them. Not not so much, but just kind of let you feel the photographs. The survivor did not dwell on death. They rebuild life. This was the lesson that they were teaching. A people must remember that it cannot live on by making a cold or in its woes. The faith of the Jews is not simply remembering the Holocaust. It is the Jewish religion, which before and after the Nazis reasserts the verse in Palms, I will not die, Psalms, I will not die, for I will live. Those who remain after the Holocaust and their children and grandchildren must live all the harder and all the more dissentingly to carry on from, for everyone of the unfinished lives. So what I just stumbled through that, but, but basically survivors were difficult because they walked that line of feeling bad for surviving and then also being inspired to carry on life, right, as a survivor. So they walked that line. And, you know, the, the people that I met there taught me a lot about, you know, being empathetic and about being, uh, having humility and being thoughtful when I was working. And a lot of these people I met and learned their story the day that I was shooting them because we were working at such a quick pace in order to be able to get the, the book done. So 
This is, um, these arms are during a, a conference of Greek survivors. And this was a big round table when you were listening to all these stories. And 97% of all the Greeks that were put in camps, 97% perished because of, of the, either the weather conditions or because of, obviously, because of, of death camps. So here's a group of survivors. Kind of the emotional experience of portraiture, expressing what you want to do to evoke a certain moment. This gentleman, um, his name is Frederick Turner. The woman before was Elizabeth Koenig. Um, Frederick's story, which how it relates photographically, is that he would paint incessantly. Uh, you know, every day he would paint these gates, and he always returned to painting these gates. And he showed us many many paintings that he did like that. So the gates represented his walking out in the world of freedom to be a survivor. And so I brought a big piece of plexiglass. And it was, I just thought, well, this could be either great or could be terrible. It could be corny. But he just went for it. And it really became one of my favorite photographs of, of, of the series. This is Bimba Beck. Now, Early on when I was showing this book and talking about it, I had some students say to me that they thought I was being somewhat manipulative by, by presenting people like this. But this is really the way she existed. I mean, she, we walked into her house, we didn't change anything, and she sat on the bed and started smoking. And so I asked her to, to stay still for one second, and that's one of the images that we got. Always so, so in the book, which was kind of my first experience in bookmaking, I worked with the art director from Rolling Stone, Fred Woodward, who's legendary and a really, really wonderful friend. And so he created these words to accompany some of the, the pieces. So, you know, that was one page, that was the left page, and that was the right page. And I just kind of wanted to show you that. So that was what he took from seeing the photographs for the first time. And then the next picture is... Um, the Mingala project, which was, you know, Dr. Mingala would take the take twins and experiment on them for, you know, to discovering sort of genetic, you know, genetic moments. And and this was uh, this was the portrait I did of these these twins who were who were separated, then brought back in, and then went into to the program with Mingala. And this was from the story that. I was telling you about with the, ba the, the uh, bakers, the three brothers. The three brothers were separated, um, and then they were brought together by their sister, who um, was having a relationship with one of, the, one of the Jewish officers within the camps, and was able to bring all the brothers back. But I mean, listen, I look at that quote. I mean, that's the most bizarre thing, but that was kind of what they were dealing with, this sort of superpowers, you know, dealing with death and dealing with, you know, this you know, these impossible situations. And so their bakery, which is really interesting, is called Three Brothers Bakery, but these are the three brothers, the Juckers. And this is a quote that, you know, I felt really represented the idea of, 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 of what the project really encompassed because you would really, you would really get to know these, these, these survivors and understand why that is a, you know, that is why the, that's the, that's the mandate. It can, cannot forget, cannot forgive and cannot forget. These are two brothers, the Tavern brothers. They were also separated and one was, was uh, responsible for saving the other one's life. So that was a Holocaust project. So that was my first experience in creating my own body of work, which was uh, really exciting and and pleasant. So then I went to back to my you know day job, and everybody I shot looked like a survivor. <laughs> it was like, oh, I got to get off this kick. So this was in the middle of, of shooting all these survivors. I had an opportunity to work with Sean Penn. I was you know thought he was one of the great actors at that time. Still, I think he's an amazing actor. 
and, uh, and, you know, really had, like, wore his scars and his battle wounds, you know, appropriately. So this was, um, you know, a very kind of reductive picture of Sean Penn. And so I started to enter back into a more reductive palette in terms of, of making portraits and, and really kind of focused on that. Somewhat environmental, sometimes environmental, sometimes back in the studio. This is during Ice-T's uh, moment in Cop Killer when he came out with this record, which was heavy metal, and, they, and they, one of the songs was Cop Killer. And so everybody was giving him a hard time about that, obviously, because he's a storyteller, and he talks about real scenarios that happened and it was happening in Los Angeles, and there was all this friction between authority and you know, inner city you know, people, and the riots were happening, and everybody was just, you know, speaking their mind, which was really great, except for they wanted him, the record company wanted him to shut up. And so I came up with this idea of just gaffer taping his mouth closed. He liked it. This was a kind of an interesting moment where I went and I shot John Lee Hooker, and first thing he said to me was when he shook my hand, as he made me feel his hands, he says, hands are just like velvet, aren't they? And I was like, yes, they really are like, just like velvet. So I shot a bunch of pictures of him, and I went home, and I said, I didn't get the picture of his hands. Like, I didn't get that picture. So I called him up and I said, hey, the cleaning lady came into the hotel room and exposed all the film. I have to come back and shoot the picture. <laughs> and he said, all right, I'll give you 20 minutes. So I went over and set up a white background on his driveway because he didn't leave his house. And uh, I did this in his driveway. This was for an assignment. Um, for Iconoclast, and um, I had uh, Paul Newman and Robert Redford in the same room together, and we were shooting a kind of a more complicated situation, but I just decided I was going to do this one portrait of them, and they both were just like, ugh, bitching me out, like, what are you doing, and aren't you supposed to be doing something else, and I said, you know, let me get one portrait. Anyway, after uh, Paul Newman passed away, I sent a portrait to Robert Redford just to let him know that I had this, and, and he was just so blown away by it. He was just so thankful that we took that picture, got that moment. I always say, you know, to uh, my assistants and to people that I'm working with that are talking about photography is that, you know, the picture you're going to most regret is the picture you don't take. So you always have to trust yourself, no matter how embarrassing it is that you know, your subject's going to just refuse. If you walk away and you don't get that picture, that's the one you're going to regret. So I try to kind of live by that philosophy. This is not an old English woman. <laughs> this is actually Mick Jagger at 49. No, this is the first time I had a chance to photograph the stones. And um, it was Wonderful. It was amazing. I was, they, they like flew me on the Concorde for a meeting to London, and then I had to come back and do the day after, and I had to set up these sets. It was very rushed, crazy. Mick and Keith were, you know, in their usual night, not talking to each other. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I can tell they're not talking to each other. It's like, don't speak to me. <laughs> so, I, I've got the, the group downstairs and no Keith. Right? So like I go up and there's Keith like listening to their new record up two floors up in a little small little space in the studio. And I'm going like, um, pardon me, Keith, uh, the guys are downstairs waiting for you. And I can tell they're getting upset. And I said, uh, do, you, do you mind coming downstairs? He goes, Mark, really? He says, I've been with these guys for 30 years and they're boring. <laughs> Can't argue with that. So little Richard, I just photographed him last year, would not take off his sunglasses. Said no. And I said, let me just do one picture digitally, and I'll show it to you. And if you don't like it, then we'll just, we'll, we, won't, we won't use that. So I put on my Hasselblad, non-digital Hasselblad, and I shot one frame and kind of distracted him and I did a couple more photographs of him, and this is the one picture I got on my house of blood. Still in a reductive, simple portraiture. This was in, in uh, 
an old loft I used to live, with, live in in Soho in, in, uh, in New York. And uh, I always loved this because um, his manager, right, Jeff Kramer, said to me, uh, Bob's going to come at five. Uh, he'll stay as long as you want, I mean, within reason. Whatever you do, don't shake his hand. Got it. I'm, you know, type is Bob Dylan. I'll shake his hand. Fine. So an elevator comes up at five, promptly at five, and there's Bob Dylan. Walks up and goes, how you doing? <laughs> Fucking always, they always get you that way. <laughs> so this is Johnny Cash. This is in... Uh, this is in a hotel room in Vegas. We'd actually just shot the morning before out in the desert, which was, uh, which was really funny. It was like I, I was trying to talk him to go out to the desert. And he said, uh, son, I can't go to the desert. My jaw will light up. It will heat up like a pistol. And then, and then I just kind of sat there and sulked for a little bit. And he looked, all right, boy, I'll go out there. But it has to be at 7 o'clock in the morning. So the next day, after we did that picture, he came to the hotel room, because I had this idea of shooting for a second article of him with his guitar behind his back because I saw him perform and that's what he did. So I used what I saw at the performance as what I think became an iconic photograph of him, which was the, you know, the man in black. This is a little interpretive dance by Tom Waits. Tom's great because Tom never really wants, what you want is you want a willing subject. And musicians are very complicated because they get into their skin and like they don't want to change. So you really have to depend on the theater of somebody if you want it to be bigger than just a portrait. So this was using, I had worked with uh, George Harrell just one time before he passed away as an assistant. And so I, I was always interested in that kind of Hollywood lighting. So this is using more kind of traditional um, movie lights for Nels in a four by five. This moment happened. We were in Indianapolis, and we had an hour with Jerry Garcia. The rule with Jerry, you had to have two six-packs of root beer and three packs of Marlboros and a guitar. And then he would stay around for 59 minutes. So I just started using a, a six by seven Pentax and was really getting interested in like what the results were of uh, just a very loose camera, Tri-X always. And my lens at that time broke, so it didn't stop down. However, I figured out what my exposure was by a po with a Polaroid rather than with a meter. So I just judged it by the Polaroid. And what happened was, by having that happy accident, I started shooting everything wide open after that and, and really became kind of a constant for a couple of years with me. So this is at 2.8 in the middle of the day, which was nutty. Um, and you can see how everything has like a three-dimensional quality because it just goes out of focus. Patty Smith, this was with a, uh, in my studio, and she walked in with her boots around her shoulder and her hat on and her coat on. And I said, don't change, walk over to the background, let me just shoot you just like that. And that was one of the first pictures we did. I always find that the moment when somebody walks into the studio and the moment when somebody leaves can actually be your best moments in taking their picture because they're not thinking about it. They are who they are. Susan Sarandon, again, kind of illustrating the simple portrait. This is recent, this is of you know, Jeff Bridges. Um, Crazy Heart was the movie he was promoting, and I did Crazy Hair. <laughs> this was an in-between moment. Uh, we were shooting an eight by 10 Polaroid. I started working with large format and uh, doing portraits. And um, you know, Bruce was, He's great, but it felt a little stiff, and I shot a Polaroid, and an 8x10 Polaroid, and he was totally like relaxed and not thinking about it because he thought it was a Polaroid. But um, I just loved what we got, so we, um, so we, we made a scan of the, the Polaroid and used this. 
So now we go, I call this kind of series in cinema. These are more when you go back and you photograph people over time, right? So Brad, I worked with early on in his career. We went, he always loves an event. Like he always wants to make it into something special. So whenever I would work with Brad in the early days, it was a two day shoot. This was in Mexico, in Mexicali, right over the border. And this is, um, kind of late in the afternoon and listening to Neil Young and smoking a joint. I wasn't. Make that clear. He was. And uh, this was on a weird deserted salt flat somewhere in Mexicali, we found. This is during Fight Club. And he decided, it was his idea, he wanted to wear a dress. I'm in. <laughs> Sounds good. And obviously smoke a couple cigarettes. This is mo the, so I didn't work with him for about a dozen years. And then this is mo the most recent shoot that we did up in Humboldt County uh, in California, up in Northern California. And uh, this was his customized bike that we shot. So we did a series of these pictures in Humboldt up in the Redwood Forest, which is magnificent. If you guys have ever been there or not, you should go. John Malkovich, so again, working with your artists and kind of creating a simple little story, uh, cinematic little moment. Peter Dinklage. And I worked with Peter a couple of times, so I knew that he was sort of game to do whatever. Um, and uh, he, kind of, he kind of loved this little moment with him. Mr. Tarantino in his screening room. This was for GQ. When you're working with magazines, there, there sometimes is a, a formula you have to follow, whether it's you know, using fashion or telling, illustrating a story that you know, they want to tell. So um, it, you know, it's not always just like going and doing a portrait, even though I try to uh, have those moments. But this is uh, in his screening room. This is Lindsay before. She decided not to take a cab. No, anyway. So this is um, early Lindsay Lohan for Vanity Fair. <laughs> this is Leonardo at 15. This is, what he, this is what he wore in his hair at the time. And that was really his muscle, sort of. <laughs> and that was him a couple years ago when we worked with GQ. I always like the, the kind of painterly quality of these photographs. I find them to be, you know, really challenging to create, you know, these stories and, and try to do them really kind of perfect, like the right styling and the right ideas and the right lights and the right location. And, I, and um, you know, there's another side to to working with artists, you know, actors and talent, and, and working with artists, with real visual artists. And this is Rim Coolhouse. And we had him for a couple of hours. I think we were in Paris. And um, we'd done a bunch of different portraits. And then I saw this, he was drawing, making a note, and I saw this light and this um, shadow come across the window. And I just had him act as if he was drawing on the window. This was in Tom Wolfe's office. Great, great writer, great man. Knows how to wear a suit. <laughs> uh, this was pretty interesting. Cindy Sherman is typically, does not allow people to really photograph her that much. I mean, there have been portraits of her, and you know, there's probably more than I think. But I like to. Um, to think that I was, I was somewhat special. Anyway, this is in her studio. And what was wonderful about doing Cindy's portrait was that I really got to learn about her process of, you know, of working a little bit and how she does it. Very scaled back, usually by herself. And she has these big containers and closets full of, you know, appendages and all kinds of 
you know, weird noses, and she like she had a whole drawer of breasts to pick from. So that's a pair I, I had. Oh, sorry. Microphone. And so we did a little mock photo shoot that she would do using her cameras and stuff. Ed Ruscha. This is for Luoma Vogue. So Luoma Vogue is always about, you know, the kind of eccentric, over-the-top fashion. So this fashion director um, created this look for Ed Ruscha, which is like pretty atypical of Ed Ruscha. Is a laid-back artist. Anyway, so I love these. I love these. Sort of the mad priest, wizard, whatever. You know who that is? I just shot this. This is Robert Frank. And this is his and his. We just got assigned this with Rolling Stone. This hadn't been published yet, but um, I got invited to go shoot Robert Frank, which was kind of a thrill. And um, and you know we kind of didn't touch anything, obviously. Uh, but I I thought this was a kind of a big home run for me because we didn't really do anything but just sort of find the moment with him. And, and it was over pretty quick too. You can't see it, but underneath his bed were just boxes and boxes of prints. So this is the series. This is Drew Barrymore, who I loved working with when I first worked for her. Check out the boxer in the background. What a great view he's got. The Bad Alice it was fun. So when I was a kid, I, my ideas come from memory, you know, and whatever I see, whatever I can think of, and just kind of turning things inside out sometimes, writing down like a list of things. I thought about, hey, what was the one thing missing in Boy Scouts? <laughs> like, wasn't it like the hot scout leader that you tied up? Which brings me into comedy. So, one of the one of the areas that that I was kind of pushed into pretty quickly was was shooting comedians, which I actually really like. Except for comedians typically think they're funnier than obviously anybody else, and they always attach. The thing that really pissed me off was that they'd always attach a line to an idea. Like you say, okay, how about this for an idea? They're like, oh yeah. And below it, I'll be holding a sign that says, you know, that's what she said. You're like, no. <laughs> anyway, so this is more of just an environmental picture. This is where Jay Leno goes every week and does stand-up. Um, and I believe it's near Venice in, um, in California. And we found an old tape of Johnny Carson and popped it in there. So... This is Carl Reiner and, and uh, Mel Brooks. This is for Vanity Fair. I, I worked on this project with Judd Apatow, and we did a bunch of comedians. What I love about these guys is that every night they both are, you know, widowers, and, and what they do every night is, is they get together and watch a movie and eat a chicken. <laughs> and they'll tell you that. And we're gonna, we're, you have to leave. We're going to eat a chicken. So I get a call from Vanity Fair. It says, like, hey, we want you to team up and do a, a really great picture of Will Ferrell. I'm like, all right. This is like, uh, Matt LeBeau is his manager. Give him a call. So I knew Matt. I called Matt. And he goes, hey, Will and I have an idea. And I said, well, what's that? And he goes, how about Will, give, Will giving birth to a chimp? <laughs> and I said, what do you think of the doctors are also chimps or ape-like? He goes, Perfect. the late Robin Williams. This was a moment where I had built this kind of weird little corner, sort of a pinnish, magritte-ish, I don't know whatever I was going, somewhere like that. And Robin, we had him for a half day, one day and a half day the following, it was like a Friday and then a Monday. And 
we did the cover shoot, and then I showed him the corner. I said, well, we're going to do that on Monday. And he goes, and he took his shoes, and he put his knees on them. And he was like, oh, yeah, like me, like toulouse the truck. This was kind of a this was kind of a random moment, but it's turned into a a good picture for me. Is we had a chimp right during the you know four scump days. I was trying to relate like you know this guy was sort of an idiot savant and was really kind of you know very basic, but at the same time sort of this expanded intelligence. And uh, and we had a chimp there, and we were trying to figure out what to do with the chimp. I just wanted, thought it'd be fun to work with the chimp. And he started the chimp started to touch Tom on his face. And it just, all of a sudden Tom said, oh, these are my hands. And we kind of created that photograph. This is Patrick Stewart. This is a guy you, you don't think is funny, right? right? So I had this shaving cream. This was my idea. And I, and I applied it on his face, which he was very lovely and warm to him. I like that. I got a little laugh off that. It makes me feel good. Jerry Seinfeld. So, did you guys know that Seinfeld was based, actually, the characters on The Wizard of Oz? That's, 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 at least that's what Jerry told me. Um, the funny thing about this was, we were, you know, we're, everything was really developed, like big sets, Colleen Atwood, who does all Tim Burton's movies, did the costuming for it. And, um, and Jerry was sick, very sick that day, and, uh, and we had a little smoke machine going through the back of the suit and through the little funnel on his head, and it stopped working. And it took us about 10 minutes to fix, like my, whatever, my special effects dude, who was not very special effects, couldn't get it to work, like, so Jerry motions for me to come over, and he has laryngitis, because like, you think it was really this difficult 50 years ago? <laughs> so this is a little naughty, so forgive me. So this is kind of a worked out the story with, uh, this is recent, with Julie Louise Dreyfus, right? So Julie Louise Dreyfus goes to this kind of crazy clown party where she kind of finds this one clown and she's very attracted to him. They end up in a drunken stupor going to, back to her room at the convention center. I'm inventing this up as I go along. Make love. <laughs> Lo and behold, it's a baby clown. And so uh, this is kind of a my exploration a little bit in, in movement and dance. And not too much I have to say about this. Anyway, this is Misha Baryshnikov. And this is where my assistant accidentally clicked my lens twice on a 4x5. And I was so pissed because I really thought I had two different exposures that were really great. And I was like, oh, fuck, you just, you just double exposed my film. And then, of course, I get the film, and I go, like, that's the best thing that ever happened, man. You're the greatest. You're the greatest system I've ever had. But that was a really lucky accident. So through dance, I got a chance to work with Merce Cunningham and his company. And uh, on his 90th year on, the earth, on Earth, on the planet, I asked him to come over to my studio, and we did 8x10 hand ballet. And we were speaking today about how, you know, the, the, the beautiful articulation and, and artistic movement of somebody, even if they can't, he was in a wheelchair, even if he can't move, still came through with the gracefulness of his hands. And then he, uh, three months later, he passed, but this is a little moment I had with Merce. And then that's Merce and Misha in my studio. Misty Copeland from uh, the ABT, my studio. And a new dancer, Calvin Harris. 
from, I believe, the ABT as well. One of the, um, what's really funny is I, you know, travel a lot. Sometimes I end up in places where there's all these different interesting things happening around me, but I'm just on an assignment. We were going to shoot Bunny Whaler in Jamaica. And Bunny became very superstitious and decided he didn't want to be photographed, which led me to a, like a four-day back and forth on the phone trying to get him to, to acquiesce and let me photograph him. And it, it never happened. But uh, I was in Jamaica, so I took my 4 by 5 out, and I put a white background, and I photographed Rastas. So, um, you know, 9-11 was a, a moment in New York where, you know, you were, you were, it felt like you were drugged. You didn't know whether you should go out and take a picture or whether you should just kind of curl up on the sofa and just be, you know, quiet, like everybody felt. And a buddy of mine who's a journalist was, um, and I, 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 I felt like the energy of going out and wanting to take pictures. And, and my buddy, Ed Keating, worked for the Times, and he was covering downtown. And he had a pass to go back and forth into Ground Zero, which was, you know, basically shut down and, and, and a crime zone. And, uh, and he got me access as a construction worker to, to go down with him one day. And I went and uh, I don't know if you ever saw the picture that he did, which is a very famous picture around the Times of the teacups. And he did a little still life of that. And um, this is kind of the same day, and I did this, this sort of bigger picture of our guy that was um, escorting us through the building that was adjacent to, the, to Ground Zero. And I don't even remember taking this picture. I did this with a little point and shoot. Um, but this was eight days after 9-11, after the, the planes hit the towers. I always found this to be such an evocative kind of fence from the skeleton from the World Trade Center. These two gentlemen were, were uh, the last to be ushered out as they were searching for their battalion. Uh, it's a crew chief and a, and, a, and a captain looking for their, the last of their truck. And I just said, could I and just take a quick pic portrait of you, and they, and they let me. And then the, after that day, everything was shut down. No one was allowed back in there. This is kind of a big moment for me, photographing President Obama. And uh, I'd photographed him once before, but this was the first time as president. And I'd had this picture in my mind, right? Like I knew that I wanted to do kind of a, a diptych of front and back. And, um, you know, so imagine you've got, like, all of his staff, Rolling Stone writer, editor-in-chief is there, Jan Winter, and I've done the, the, the cover portrait, which was kind of walking down the corridor in the Rose Garden. And I said, uh, President Obama, I want to do a picture of you, a diptych of, of your front and your back. And he goes, kind of thought, he goes, is that going to make my ears look big? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't, I don't think your ears are big. Anyway, I was, I was, so, so that's a portrait that I wanted to take, and, and I, but I had to think about it before I took it. It wasn't, it wasn't random. It was very, very well thought out picture. This is a four by five I shot of, of Carter. And, uh, and he was just cantankerous that day, just not friendly. Um, but I kind of loved when he was just sitting there and just like had an off moment. I loved the hand. I loved the kind of the power of the grip of him, like this kind of like man that's just holding on. You know, the kindness that this, these eyes have have you know, experience. He's just a, the, was the most gentle soul I'd ever experienced. We were shooting in a remote town in South Africa, 
and uh, <clears throat> it was at a hotel. And when Mandela was brought up to us, I was shooting for um, Ampar. And when Mandela was brought up to us to photograph, the entire hotel was outside. Every worker was outside crying. And he just was like this, he was just their spiritual, you know, guide. This is a, a really nice breakthrough moment for me. We, we got a chance to shoot the Dalai Lama and then photograph the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama always wears those ridiculous glasses and a big watch. So I was told by thousands of monks, like, do not ask the Dalai Lama to take off his glasses or take his watch off. And so I had a portrait I wanted to do. I would shot all the other stuff I needed to do. And I said, OK, I want to do a quick four by five. And I said, do you mind taking off your glasses and your watch? The monks just like looked at me and took them off. And uh, this was just a couple of frames we shot. But I, I just love the kind of the beautiful blackness, the marble of his eyes. It's Hillary. That was in, uh, in uh, India. And just a quick little moment with her. This is the uh, wonderful Malala. You know, so I was photographed her for Time Magazine last year. And um, this was the first photograph that was done after she had been shot. Am I blocking anybody over there? I'm sorry if I am. So the journey kind of goes into my interest in working outside of you know, my comfort zone. So I, I've been working in the fashion world a little bit and shooting, creating stories through um, clothing, so, which is a really nice, different experience where you work with great models and you kind of tell them what the story is and have them work it out. So this is for, that was for Italian Vogue. This was Charlize for um, Elle magazine. It's Kerry Washington for Italian Vogue. Kind of a Diana Ross story. Beautiful, great stylist, great hair and makeup. The whole thing is, you know, very beautifully orchestrated with support. Another photograph from Italian Vogue I did with Ariane Phillips, same person that worked with me in the early days with uh, Fleetwood Mac. Um, and this is much, much more recent. And uh, this was for a story on the fashion of Cavalli. Another story I did with Ariane at the, um, at the theater, uh, the Geary Theater in, um, a Disney theater in LA. It was a red story we worked on. A lot of times with a, with a magazine like Italian Vogue or some of the other uh, uh, Harper's Bazaar, we'll use actresses as models, which is not that easy because they typically don't move the same way. But anyway, this was Emma Watson, and this was for Italian Vogue, and this was Couture. So the way Couture works is that, um, you know, you go and you set up your picture, and then the clothes, the designers come up with the Couture, they send out the Couture outfits, and you have an hour to shoot them, and then they leave, and they go to the next photographer. So this was, I think this was Galliano. It's for um, German Vogue, a story on Mickey Mouse. This was a, a story we did of, you know, kind of 20, 1920s burlesque in, uh, in France. And this was shot in a French theater in Paris. And that's Diana Kruger, Diane Kruger. And Kristen, this was for Italian Vogue. So just a little bit, quick little story about making covers. So you make a cover, right? You take a picture, and then you always have to have the experience of where the type goes, right? So as a cover photographer, that's, that's where I've gotten a lot of strength in, in being able to do that. This is what happens when you leave the band before the Rolling Stone cover comes out. 
he actually got fired, and, and the band was mad at me for a long time for not putting him in there. It wasn't my decision, it was the art direction. But anyway, they took him out. Brad. And then this was a photograph I did from a session that was in conjunction with In Utero. And I did a portrait of Kurt, and it was the Polaroid negative that was the picture that, again, it was like that off moment that he wasn't really thinking about it. But there was this really interesting quality about he was looking at the camera. He was, he seemed, maybe it was just dazing out, but to me it seemed like there was this melancholy, forlorn look in his eye. This kind of sadness. And everybody had thought he was like clean and happy and married and kid and blah, blah, blah. And then two months later he, um, he passed away. He shot himself and this was the memorial issue. So I'm going to kind of run through this because we're running out a little bit of time. But anyway, this is a book I did in the top of my building. I found this beautiful skylight from taking out the elevator shaft. And we had to put in a stairwell because of the egress and blah, 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 permitting things. But we built a kind of a little studio up there. And we, I created a little theater within these four walls, very small little space. And we shot these, a series of portraits in there. That was the previous moment was of me shooting Bruce, and then this was the, the image. This is an amazing performer by the name of Bill Irwin. And we had photographed him for probably two hours, and this was one of the last pictures we did. Just a quick, I picked up my two and a quarter, and just he said, okay, let me try something. And he made this incredible physical U-shape, which is not easy. Michael and I have worked together for many years, and when I was telling you about the project, I said I'd really love to photograph you and, um, and Ali for the you know, simple reason that they both were, were fighters in their, in their disease. And so we made Ali the, the coach and Michael the boxer, which was the comedy. Julia. The great Robert Wilson. Amazing artist, amazing playwright. This woman was, uh, is Azar Nafasi, who wrote the book Reading uh, Lolita in Tehran. And this was a moment where we, the stairwell series was really about bringing mainstream and, and kind of per peripheral characters together into one book and into one theater, really. So every time we would bring somebody in, those walls would change, and it would, they, would, they would take, they would make their own story. But it was very reductive and very kind of quiet. And then I also started to learn a little bit about the platinum palladium process, which, and this Richard Serra, which will lead to um, the final selection of work. Willie Nelson, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Again, uh, Cindy Sherman. Now, you got to love this guy, Peter Beard. I said, you know, why don't you come? We'll put a couple paintings up, and we'll can kind of give this illusion that, you know, you're, we'll bring a girl in, that you're kind of working with this model. And he goes, oh, no, I got you covered. I'll just bring some of my friends. <laughs> sure enough, doorbell rings. It's like, Four beautiful women. Matthew Barney, great artist. This was a mask that was used in Cream Master, one of his movies. And, um, and my friend did the prosthetic on it. And so I talked to Matthew about doing the shot. And Gabe also helped me to, to seal that deal. And we took the mask and we cut it in half. And then he did a beautiful job of seaming it together. But that's, you know. That's all on camera. Woody Allen. So this was, this is the last piece of work I'm going to show you. This is um, a real departure for me where I took very class, my own interpretation of very classic photographic themes, which is landscapes, still life, and nudes. And um, 
loosely, loosely used uh, themes. Um, and started with the process, which was a platinum palladium print, and more importantly, a 30 by 40 platinum palladium print. So we're making oversized negatives and we're making contact prints onto hand painted paper that we made at the studio. So this was a snowstorm in New York, but this was at Coney Island. So it really has this beautiful, kind of almost a Rothko experience. That was actually the same day in the morning at the boathouse in Central Park and dealing with like an abstraction. So taking like what would be a kind of typical angle of whatever you were to see, like reality, and then moving my camera around and finding something that was really about abstraction and design and negative and positive space. I was on a job shooting Tiger Woods mistresses. <laughs> Swear to God, I was up there photographing a mistress for the story for Vanity Fair, and it was the most beautiful, snowy, foggy day, which was perfect for what I was doing in terms of landscapes. And I had my 4x5 there, and so I just shot it out the window and I made that photograph. Uh, I'm, I've always really loved the kind of the texture of the, of the light drops on the window. And this was a job we were doing where we had a couple of props. We had a, a hairless cat and we had some cars, seriously, we had cards. And I was shooting Gary Oldman, who didn't want to be holding a, 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 a hairless cat. And he thought that was too weird. I was like, have you seen your old, your past pictures? Um, but anyway, so I just used them for myself and created this little still life. And I consider this to be a still life. Nude. So I wasn't really going to do portraits, but we started to kind of connect a little bit in, in terms of, um, of um, body modification. And I really found the idea that we modify the way that we look with something artificial and create these illusions was really interesting, especially when they were to, um, to go to such an extreme. That was another still life. That was just a found object on a shoot that I was shooting in Paris. That was in um, Brazil. But it's kind of a drag because if you were to see the prints, the prints are beautiful and, you know, kind of a different experience than seeing them on a screen, but just to kind of give you a little bit. This was back in Central Park. This was in the springtime and just right when everything was budding. And it, it, it almost feels like, you know, uh, when you look at it close up, it's kind of like a daguerreotype or a landscape from, from photo succession even. So it was this, um, and then I went back and shot the same scene in, uh, in the wintertime. That's, you know, obviously Morris Cunningham's hands again. This is uh, one of the first pictures, landscapes I took, which the rule of thumb was, and I'll read you a little quote by Minor White, the rule of thumb was um, when you approach something to photograph it, first be still with yourself until the object of your intention affirms your presence. Then don't leave until you have captured its, its essence. And that's minor white. So that to me really encapsulated my thinking about going out and taking a picture, making a picture, not creating a picture but allowing that picture to come to me. And so this photograph was done on New Year's Eve. I was waiting for a friend to come by and kind of on my own in New York. Everybody else was going out of town. I was just a nice, quiet little afternoon. And as the sun went down, this fog rolled in. And I live right on the water on the Hudson in, in the West Village. And these piers just looked like these beautiful, you know, time lost in New York City and I went down with my 4 by 5 and I started to take, you know, compose and take this picture by myself. And as I was standing there, it was just at that little last moment of light, 
tail end of it, and I was just on the edge, like a 30 second exposure of it just being at the end. I look back and there's like 25 people standing behind me watching what I'm doing and just like really like enjoying this like little moment. It was warm, it was like it was today. And I realized that if I'm enjoying it, then other people must, must be enjoying it too because as a photographer, your sight and your vision is heightened, right? So, you know, that's when I started to really explore the idea of like not hesitating to go out and take a picture. This photograph means a lot to me because it was, I had just left Houston. My father had been in the hospital and had been very sick in ICU, uh, ICU and uh, he was supposed to die. And he didn't, he kept on holding on. So my mom finally said, look, you know, my brothers and my sister and I, you guys gotta go do your thing, come back tomorrow, whatever, and I had a job in LA, so I traveled to Los Angeles, and I was shooting Billy Bob Thornton, which I had was a weird anyway, just like I'm shooting Billy Bob Thornton, my father's sick. And I saw this in this warehouse, I saw this decayed bird, and I just thought, you know, this kind of represents something to me, I'm not sure, and then 12 hours later my father passed, but I always feel like that was sort of this, sort of preemptive moment of, of understanding death. It was a kind of a still life we made at the studio. Beautiful platinum print. And this guy, it's a little out of sequence, but this guy was, what was his name, Brian? George or something like that? Harold? It's like, I'm at a Jane's Addiction concert, right? I'm like walking around, getting ready for the show, excited. And, uh, and I see this, sea of people, it was like the Red Sea parting, right? Like all these people are like, whoa. And I see this guy walking through and he's got metal hanging off his face. I mean, it's like a lot of metal. And I, I kind of watched him and then he went into the bathroom and people were still kind of like, ooh, you know, just not happy with him. And he walked out and I said, uh, hi, I'm, I, I gave my car, I said, hi, I'm Mark Seliger, I'm a photographer. I, God, I just think you look amazing. I would love to take your picture. And I didn't know what I was going to get. And he was like, well, I'm George. Uh, yeah, I, I could use a headshot. <laughs> Guy came over the next day. Got him a headshot. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Uh, before... Before, before I forget, I just wanted to let you guys ask a couple questions in one second, but I just wanted to thank, thank you guys for coming, first of all. Wonderful audience and being patient. Also, AS, I have to do this, this is probably quick. ASNP director elect Tom Kennedy. Tom, where are you? It's Tom Kennedy. The DC Chapter Press, David Weigel. Who, David, is, David is responsible for uh, arranging to have the studio come out here. Uh, again, Brian, thank you so much for incredible support. Uh, the Smithsonian Art Museum, thank you. And uh, Betsy Brin, the museum director of uh, the American University. Thank you very much, too. And last but not least, Theo Adamstein from uh, Photo Week DC. So I think we have a few minutes, right, to a couple, couple questions, no? You guys have any big Epiphanies I can help you with? <laughs> yes, this young lady over here in the back row. Uh, what has digital allowed you to do that film didn't allow you to do? One more time. What did, has digital allowed you to do that film didn't allow you to do? Well, digital, I mean, if you will, I mean, this is one of the questions that we all ask. Like, you know, technology kind of interrupts us a little bit from like what we're used to, right? It's like, you know, that, that comfort level sometimes can be, especially if you like the mechanical aspect, the tactile aspect. But I, but I think digital, if it's, if it's thought of as like a um, parallel, a sister, 
it's like a paintbrush, right? So what I like about digital is that um, I can still use my vocabulary as a, as a photographer with you know, the analog experience, but with digital I can kind of just, it's almost like the recording industry, you can, you can, you can put in it, in, you can process it the way you want to. But um, it takes me less time to get there usually than it did with film. However, in saying that, I think um, in, in the process of making the picture, you, you need to remove yourself from always looking at the screen. Like a screen should be, you know, checking exposure, but the minute that you lose that impact of, of being, you know, involved with your subject, to having that relationship between your subject and yourself, then it, it gets tricky. And then also, people look at pictures and they get self-conscious and, you know, we really try to, to not use a screen always, you know, inside of the subject. If you could give one piece of advice to a young photographer about bringing your ideas to life, like the crazy things you think of that you really would want to photograph, what would it be? Well, I mean, I, I think that process is, is always the most important in the process of thinking and the process of uh, creating, right? It's, it's how you visualize something. It's, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not the, the best person to really take it in a, in a spontaneous place because I usually work my pictures out before I take them. And then everything else is gravy. So what I think is important for, you know, somebody who's really trying to d develop the idea of, of, you know, being more conceptual is to write everything down that you can about your idea. Everything from if you flip it over or if you look at it one way. And then just start to eliminate till you find out you know, two or three ideas that you have that you're excited about. And then just narrow it down to that. And then don't deviate from that unless the, 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 the subject takes you down that road. So when you are shooting portraits, uh, when do you decide to enlist the use of hair or makeup person, when do you think that that would actually detract from the subject you're trying to portray? Well, I mean, it's, hair and make, support can be good or can be bad. I mean, it can, you know, I always, I always try to walk that line where, you know, if it's a portrait, not to change things too much. Sometimes somebody will walk in and, and like the Patti Smith picture, I mean, I think we had a groomer there, but when she walked in, there was no reason to touch a thing. It looked, she looked amazing. And, um, and so hair and makeup and, and styling can add to it, but I think you have to be very, very careful of it. You know, use it respectfully. And, but in a fashion story, it's the exact opposite. You start it with hair and makeup, like that creates your, your, your idea. Somebody might walk in and look great and you, you can kind of use it, but that's usually not the case because those are not the portraits that you're, that's not the kind of work you're gonna do as a fashion photographer. You're gonna, you're gonna create a story, you're gonna create a, a character. Thank you. Oh, there must be one more question. Right here. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering, although there's many talented photographers, what do you think has made you unique in the fact that you have been more successful than others? Just my good looks. <laughs> Besides that. Charm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hard on myself. I, you know, I work every single day on, you know, my job and, and I try to, try to, you know, each time I get an assignment, I try to make the best out of that assignment that I possibly can. So, I mean, it is, you know, it's a little bit bold to say like your, your last job is, you know, your next job is your last job, but, you know, you really have to treat, you know, a career as a long, term experience and be respectful of that as you move forward. So you always are kind of recreating, I'm always recreating myself. I'm always trying to figure out like, you know, I have my tricks and tools and things I go back to, but you know, 
the minute that I start to feel too comfortable, I try to go into an area where I'm less comfortable. I mean, fashion, for instance, like when we started doing fashion, people were going like, you're never gonna do this. And we're not, I'm not that great, great at it, but I enjoy the experience of being able to do something like that. Same with portraiture. You know, portraiture is one of those experiences where it's endless. I mean, you can change a format out of a camera or you can change an idea or you can go from a lighting situation to a non-lighting situation and it's always going to be different. And I think you just have to really challenge yourself in order to be able to do it. And, you know, I've had a 30-year career by, you know, just basically being miserable. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, this guy? Oh. Um, that, was a, that was an interesting... Well, I knew that he was obviously, like, going to be a willing player in the subject. What I did was I... I mean, not very much. I said, that's an 8 by 10. So I knew that that detail, I treated it like an object, right? Because I didn't want it to be about a portrait. I didn't want it to be portraits in this book. I wanted it to be an object. So I thought of it like you'd, something you'd look at, like the way that you would view a beautiful vase. So I lit it like an, like lit him like an object. And I kind of watched his body movement. And I had him just kind of like shrink his body down to where the whole thing felt like, you know, almost like a vessel. And then I think the eyes just became like this one more element to the jewelry. So that's all we did. It's just, it was very, it was very, re oh, he brought a, some girl too that we had to photograph him with. I was like, yeah, this is my girlfriend. She's, you know, she doesn't drink anymore. I had to hear that from him. Got it. It's going to be the couple portrait. But, you know, we got... And what's really beautiful is that, is that when we turn it into a platinum, it really, like the impact of it in a big platinum, it really became like this object for us. So, so that was the prep I did for it. It was very minimal. And, you know, I like working that way sometimes. So I like big, fun pictures too, but... Yeah. Oh, no, this is in my studio. Yeah, I, I lit this in my studio, and then he came to my studio, yeah. God, if only we could talk. Yeah, uh, how do I see my work evolving? Well, we're actually, I can't really talk about my n latest project, but we're working on a new body work in New York, um, but it's more documentary. It's, 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 uh, it's a part of New York that is vanishing in their portraits. And uh, it's all more or less street work. So, and um, I'm shooting everything on square. So it's, it's, it's a specific look. And we're about, to, I, can't, I can't say, about, say anything about it yet because it's sort of sworn to secrecy, but uh, it's, 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 it, pertinent to what's happening in the world today in, in terms of sexuality and life and cities and urban and it just kind of like has a really relevant feeling to me. So we're, we're, we're working on that. And then uh, commercially, I mean, it's interesting. I think it's the best time I've ever had. It's like a, uh, a lovely mix of portraits and fashion and comedy and you know, I think it, it, it's a good time to be able to, to wear a, a couple of different hats, you know. It's like, it's hard to do just one thing and have people keep calling you back. And, uh, you know, I think that photography can be a young man's game, but I think it can also be about a long time career. And I think that you guys, you know, how many people are out there are photographers? You know, so there's, so there's that's a good, you know, we're all in the same world, right? So. The way that we think we should think about, you know, the journey is is just being excited, right? So that's 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 sort of where we're at. Yes, sir. Who would you most like to take for a portrait? Oh, nobody. 
<laughs> Nobody taking my portrait. Mm -mm. Not even my mama. <laughs> Sorry, mom. No pictures. I just vomit. No, um, you know, I think you have to find a way to stay calm, right? Because there's never been a shoot in the last, you know, three decades where, where I haven't had to make it a negotiation in some respect. It's almost 99.9% .9 of the time. And I think it's really about the way that you communicate that, right? Like our job as a photographer, if we're doing portraits, is to be able to communicate what we want. And so having a good, a, 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 a way to articulate what your idea is. To, I always think it's really wonderful to study directors because directors really know how to communicate what they need from their actors. And our job is not dissimilar from that, you know? So, I mean, I do a little bit of, work on myself to try to just calm down before a shoot um, and you know take a few minutes just to kind of just go into a zone but I also try to be prepared you know being a little overly prepared is never a bad thing we have some questions over on the side yeah oh sorry uh, thank you you've oh, sorry, not, not this gentleman no <laughs> <laughs> you've talked about how carefully you plan um, uh, your portraits mm-hmm what about the framing? I, some of these shots, you know, the head's centered, some it's off. Sometimes the head's not entirely in the frame. Yeah. Sometimes the hair is not entirely in the frame. How do yeah. you go about that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a big fan and have been for, for since school of like that kind of like off moment in, in framing. And uh, like uh, Scribneski, Penn, Avedon, uh, uh, Diane Arbus even. I mean, I kind of loved when things are not, you know, just perfectly framed. And, you know, I think about my teacher, James Newberry, was really about always uh, interpreting a photograph from four sides, right? So you had your foreground, your background, and then you had your four aspects to the, to the frame. And so I just make very subtle movements when I'm working to kind of find a composition that maybe feels a little bit uncomfortable or brings in some tension, but it can be the simplest photograph. And I think even that, you know, decisive, you know, visual experience can change the way a picture looks. So I just kind of try to fish around until I find something that feels like I'm on track, you know, and maybe it's like a quick little turn of the head or it's dropping a camera a little lower or raising it, you know, and the simple portrait can change dramatically. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first, I have Hi. to say that uh, Listen, amazing book. Oh, thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple questions. One, um, well, you kind of answered the first one. Uh, the assistant, you said, uh, the double exposure. Mm -hmm. The assistant clicked it twice. I was just wondering how you feel about, like, is that your photo or is it his? <laughs> and just, wait, wait, second, second question. Well, I, it, I hope um, it was my fault. How do, you feel, how do you feel about them cutting one of the peppers out of your, out of your photo? I mean, like, as a photographer. Well, it, it, it was a time when it when, uh, didn't really matter what I said. It was like it was really an editorial decision, and uh, and I learned about it, you know, kind of in the final stages. And you know, it was in '92, so I was pretty new to the magazine, so I didn't really know I could say too much. And I didn't show that. I didn't really feel that that great about it because I knew they were going to be upset. But I mean, it was it's not my magazine. You know, I'm a hired gun, and. Uh, so you had no real say in. Yeah, what I, they did I, I, I could have fought it, but, but it, I would have gone nowhere because it was more of a, it was more of a editorial decision, and he had just gotten fired. In terms of uh, my assistant, you know, in the process of taking a four by five when you're working with with an with an artist, you know, my 
relationship with them is, is constant. Like, I'm always watching them, I'm talking to them, I'm doing stuff. So my assistants, what they do is that with a 4 by 5 there's somebody that's talking the camera and there's somebody loading a camera. And, there's, and I'm directing my subject. So if that synch synchronicity is off and somebody pulls, doesn't put back the slide, and then that communication drops and he double exposes, you know, it's very easy to do. It's like you just, he just caught the camera and the guy had the slide out. So that's what happened. So, I mean, it was, it was a great accident. And actually it led to a series of double exposures. So, I mean, was I mad for a second, but fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's a, an emotional experience. I think when you look at something and, um, I mean, like I go back to that a picture of Obama. Like there's a, a lot of, of, there's a lot of importance on rec recognizability, right? Like when you, when you love or you're a fan or whatever. But for me, it's all about that little turn and that little twist or that little sense of emotion. I mean, photographing the Holocaust survivors, like, that was just like rich in tears and in faces and you know storytelling, and then with Obama, it was just that definitive, beautiful silhouette of you know this guy that we have gotten to know from many different angles, and that was just one that you, was sort of unexpected, and it was so formal that it really made a lot of sense. And um, the first photograph portrait that really made sense to me was the Arnold Newman picture of Stravinsky, which uh, we were looking at that picture earlier on, the first one of, the, of, of Lowell, the gentleman on the car, the cowboy in the car. That, that, uh, that was my early attempt at to kind of create an Arnold Newman photograph, but I always loved, you know, that experience of the way that somebody cleverly composes a photograph to where it either mimics an idea or there's some relationship to surrounding, I don't know, it's just a portrait evokes a, an emotional response or a smile or just some kind of relationship to the viewer. And, you know, if you want to geek out a little bit, I mean, there's nothing like a beautiful print, you know, and that with a, with a dynamic composition and emotional experience and a beautiful print, it's just win-win. So. If we could take the last two questions on the other side of the auditorium, and then for any other questions, you can follow us into the lobby where Mark will be signing books. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you think is the most important element in your photographs and why? Focus. No. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think myself. I think always considering myself within the experience of taking a picture and, and being true to, to me is the way I feel about my photography. Being, trying to be in some sense original, not relying on a lot of, you know, images that I've seen before. You know, sometimes you can use, a, you can use an homage, but I've gotten away from studying pictures before I go and I, I do a picture in terms of all the, you know, bells and whistles. I try to like remove myself a little bit from that. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is more of a technical question. Um, I was just wondering, do you have a, a process? Do you shoot always with a tripod or um, 85 millimeter lens? Oh, uh, you know, that, that is, that is, uh, yeah, just kind of like the opposite of the way I work. I mean, I have, you know, a, a room of just like little weird tricks. And every, it's like, a, it's like sometimes you're hungry for Chinese food. And sometimes you just, you know, you want to just jump into, uh, you know, a, a bagel and lox. And uh, that's the way I kind of do it. It's just like I have no idea where it's going to go until, you know, I have the, the idea down and then it, it takes a life of its own. I mean, we use 
continuous lights, we used daylight, we used strobes, we used large format, we used digital, we used pinhole, we, you know, um, tripods, no tripod. I mean, the minute that I feel too comfortable with things feeling too still, I'll walk around with, you know, a 35 until I find a composition. One trick I found that you guys are really, you might find useful is, um, you know how all cameras now have motion, right? So I found a trick that when you walk around shooting motion and you interact with your subject, you find some really cool compositions that you wouldn't normally find by having your camera on a tripod. I find sometimes a tripod can be really, you know, just a little too formal. But at the same time, the way that Avedon thought about it was that he wanted, with an A by 10, he wanted it to, to to really eliminate any distance between him and a subject. He wanted that relationship to be so tight that the only thing that they could react to was in the expression. So that, that was his, one of his little tricks. And that was a very reductive, controlled way of working. So I'm kind of the opposite in a lot of the ways that I work. I kind of move around until I find something and then lock into it or play with lighting, or fine light. So think of it as a paintbrush. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you might not like bagels and locks. But. <laughs> All right, guys. Love you. Thank you.